<laughs> Great. And the next one. So Greg gave me a big build up about looking into the future and I planned an introduction for the day, but you've heard some um, great talks from Elizabeth and uh, Nina and Ola. And so I kind of subtly rearranged it to, um, to fit into this position in the program. And one thing I think is important for you to know is that you're not alone, that a lot of people uh, get myeloma and as you get um, more old or elderly, there's a greater chance of developing myeloma. So there are many thousands of cases each year in the US, um, but there's similarly a lot of people who develop myeloma below the age of 40. And we need to rationalize um, how we treat older, frailer patients and younger, less frail patients. And I heard Ola mention the word cure, and I think we need to think of functional cure, cure for the older person and cure for the younger person, and what uh, you can do with the therapy to bring that about. The other thing about the cause of myeloma, I think it's important to say, while we've found genetic factors that are associated with it, your offspring are not at risk of developing myeloma. And that's uh, an important thing to know. Next slide, please. And so I think you've heard about the muggers, smoldering myeloma, myeloma, plasma cell, leukemia transition. And I just wanted to make the case that myeloma is part of a family of diseases called the plasma cell dyscrasias, of which by far and away the commonest is MGUS, a benign pre-malignant uh, condition that can turn into myeloma at about 1% per annum. And while now we're talking about treating myeloma, I think where we're heading in the future is how if you have one of these early benign conditions, you make sure that you don't turn into a disease characterized by the end organ damage that I'll go into next. Next slide, please. So I was gonna talk about the pathology of myelomas so that you have some understanding of what it is that you're in a fight with to overcome. So the next slide, please. So this is uh, your leg bone, the femur, the thigh bone. And it's a good example to show where blood cells are made because myeloma is a disease of the blood cells. And at each end of that bone, uh, is really where the, the blood is made, in the head of the femur and down towards the knee. And all of those things are in the bone marrow and they contain lymphocytes and plasma cells whose job it is to make antibodies, because we all know about antibodies now since COVID, to fight infection. So the next slide, please. And these are the bad cells. Uh, I think you really need to know, again, what you're in a fight with. And these plasma cells are abnormal and have abnormal features. Normally, there are less than 5% of these cells in the bone marrow. But when you have myeloma, you have many of these cells. Uh, up to 60% of all of the bone marrow can be replaced by cancerous plasma cells, myeloma cells. And that is what we're trying to treat. And those cells all come from one original damaged cell. So they're called clonal. And if you have watched Star Wars and you know the Clone Wars, so you're in your own Clone War trying to eradicate 
the myeloma clone. So next slide, please. And because all of the cells are the same, or all come from the one mother cancer cell or the cancer stem cell, they produce one antibody. And on the left, you can see what an antibody looks like under the microscope with this Y-shaped structure. But when there are lots of that protein in the blood, on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see the lines with the arrows. And that is an antibody that's been just visualized on a strip of paper that separated everything, all the proteins in the blood by size. And so that is an M spike or a paraprotein. And when they're not intact molecules and they're just half of a molecule, they're called light chains. And those light chains fall out in the urine and can damage the kidney. So next slide. And so what does myeloma do to your body? Well, uh, it can put holes in the bone marrow. It can resolve calcium from the bone marrow and cause a high calcium. It can cause infections. It can cause bone marrow suppression and it can cause kidney problems, all of which lead to the symptoms and signs that the patient has of back pain, bone pain, fractures, tiredness and lethargy and recurrent infections. And if things are really out of control, you can develop kidney problems. And that's why it's really important uh, to heed the message about drinking uh, plenty of fluid to keep the kidneys flush out. So next slide, please. And the purple circles show where the cells are made. And not surprisingly, where those cells are made, they cause damage to the bone. And so on the top, you can see an X-ray of the skull with a classic pepper pot skull with the kind of lesions um, eroding the bone. You can see the upper arm with a large hole in the middle of it, which subsequently fractured. Um, and in the bottom, you can see a sort of collapsed, moth-eaten spinal cord or spinal, spinal column, uh, which has been damaged by the myeloma. Next slide, please. So this is historic, and this is some diagrams in the mid 1800s showing what they saw in patients and what the bones looked like after that patient has died. And we don't see that anymore. Uh, you'll not see that in the clinic. But 30 years ago, patients had that kind of appearance. And I kind of put it up just to illustrate to you how much has changed and how well we're doing with the treatment of myeloma with deep remissions being the rule in more than 80 to 90% of all cases. So next slide, please. And I've made this point before, look after your kidneys. Um, it's an awful issue if you develop renal failure and you need dialysis, so you should avoid dehydration. Uh, you should avoid infection. And if you get temperatures, it's really important that uh, you take antibiotics, make sure you're hydrated. And in sunny days like it is here today in New York, you should be drinking plenty of fluid. So next slide. So, and also then after having told you what the disease looks like and how it affects people, was to come to the genetics of, of multiple myeloma which is becoming more and more understood and we're using it in the clinic to treat people. So next slide. So this tries to tell you that damaged DNA in the plasma cells 
causes the abnormal behavior of multiple myeloma. And you can think of it as the hallmarks of your cancer, where the cells fail to die, they keep growing inappropriately, they grow in the wrong places, and they destroy normal tissue. And this is all because of the damaged DNA code within those cells. And to understand more how we use this in the clinic, you need to understand that the DNA is packed into chromosomes. So next slide. And the chromosomes come as 23 pairs, X and Y, and what's effectively miles and miles of DNA is wrapped up and condensed into these 23 pairs, which you can see at the bottom right of the, of the figure. Next slide. And this is the chromosomes from somebody with multiple myeloma. And you can see they're grouped into apparent pairs, but often there are three copies of the chromosome rather than two. And you can see rather unusually that many of the odd numbered chromosomes are triplicated. And that's called hyperdiploidy. And about 50% of myeloma has this hyperdiploidy. It's a good performing subset of myeloma. Also, bits of the chromosomes are moved from one site to another site, and you can see that there are some green bits next to purple bits when each chromosome should be a homogeneous color. And that's called a chromosomal translocation or a chromosomal rearrangement. Next slide. And so chromosome 14 is special in myeloma and it frequently has these rearrangements and causes these subsets of multiple myeloma. A classic one is called 1114. It's a relatively good performing subgroup. Another example is the 414 which is seen in 15% of all cases and is said to have a relatively poor outcome and to respond best to protein zone inhibitors. So next slide. And so more recently, we've shown looking at the mutations or the single nucleotide mutations, that myeloma is a disease of the RASMAP kinase pathway and you can take inhibitors of that pathway in people that have these mutations, 50% of all cases, and you can induce them into a remission. But because not all of the tumor cells have those mutations, patients often relapse early. And on the right, there's a tree, and you can see that it says primary translocations and hyperdiploidy. So if you can target those at the root of the tree, the whole tree will die. But you can see that the RAS pathway is illustrated as part of a branch. And so what happens is, in those cases, you sort of prune the tree and just kill the cells that happen to have those mutations. Next slide. We have to understand myeloma biology if we're going to cure the disease. So next slide. And this kind of tells you how it's set up and integrates all of that information. There are translocations, 50%, hyperdiploidy, 50%. You develop those lesions in your lymph glands and then a cell migrates to the bone marrow where it establishes its own environment, it sets up its own blood supply and becomes more and more independent from that environment over time until it can grow in the blood as plasma cell leukemia. And that progression is called, yeah, that pathway of K 
cancer progression is very important to understand because if you can understand what drives that, then you can kill the cancer cells. Next one, please. And so when that cell hits the bone marrow, what we found out from the sequencing was it's not clonal in the classic sense of the word. If you look within that clone, there's variation. And that variation allows evolution to happen in the bone marrow. So everybody's disease is changing all of the time as your immune system is trying to kill it and it's trying to escape from the immune system. And so that's very important to understand because it tells you that uh, if you use chemotherapy, you'll get uh, resistance. If you use the immune system, you might be able to do better, but you might still get resistance. Using them both together is likely to be the most successful for curing patients. Next slide. And so if we're talking about progression, I showed you Muggers, I showed you myeloma, I showed you plasma cell leukemia. This is work that we've done uh, with Ola and Francesco down there in uh, Miami. And we showed that there's big differences the genetics between these stable Muggers conditions, which are very bland, don't look aggressive at all and just sit there and myeloma, which is number one, where there's branching evolutionary pathways, multiple subclones, aggressive mutations. And we're trying to work out a genetic classification so we can tell people with Muggers that they're going to be stable for the long term and tell others that they may be more likely to progress. And then to offer those patients some kind of intervention to stop the disease progressing. So next slide. And one of the ways we're doing that, doing this is to characterize smoldering myeloma and to look at the molecular features which push it forward. And there is clearly aggressive variants which make the disease grow more quickly. There are ones that just lead to a slow progression. And then there are others which are very well behaved and highly likely, unlikely to move forward. So next slide. And so this is myeloma over, over time. And think of it as multiple cells that are the same, but different, that have different behavior patterns. And these can grow out, and then they can become extinct. They compete with one another, and one that's very well adapted to growth will replace everything else, and then you'll be treated. All of those cells will go, and then a relapse, a single cell or two cells leads to progression of the disease. In order to get rid of the disease, I think what Ola has told you about MRD is important. Getting rid of all of the visible disease is really important. Next slide. And so this is what you're told, what you read on the internet that says, myeloma's um, relapsing remitting condition with first line, second line and third line therapy, ultimately everybody dies of the disease. And I'm here trying to tell you that you shouldn't believe this, that this is not necessarily the case going forward. And next slide. That going forward, this is what we should think of as the treatment paradigm for myeloma, where you treat people when they progress, you treat them to a complete remission, and then you maintain them in a complete remission as long as you possibly can without uh, signs or symptoms of the disease. And for a lot of people, this is very um, feasible and I think is the current therapeutic aim. Next slide. 
And so how do we go about controlling and curing multiple myeloma? So next slide. So we have our own four horsemen of the apocalypse of agents that kill myeloma, the image drugs, proteasome inhibitors, single antibodies and hybrid antibodies. So the question is, how do we use those effectively in the clinic? And next slide. And we come back to Greg's iceberg again. And this is what treatment looks like, I think, in 2022. There's some form of induction. You may or may not receive a stem cell transplant you're likely to receive some kind of consolidation treatment to decrease the bulk of the disease, and then you're gonna have some form of maintenance. And on the right, you can see the depth of response is important, and the deeper the response, the better the long-term outcome. So an early aim of therapy for a lot of people is deep, deep response. I should say it is not essential for everybody to achieve that deep response because some people do well for a long term, even though they don't achieve MRD negativity. And understanding those differences is really important to us treating people optimally. Next slide. During maintenance, what we're trying to do is to adjust that competition between the cancer cells and the immune system to make sure that it's not possible for the cancer cells to grow back. And so there's a lot of scope for immunotherapy to control the disease during these response phases. So understanding response, not just whether cancer is there or not, is very, very important because we want to alter the biology of that remission phase to favor non-recurrence and cure. Next slide. And so immunotherapy is using the body to fight cancer. And I'm sure Nina will have told you about this and will have explained it more eloquently than I, but this is very important to patients. And we do it already with the image drugs, Revlimid. So next slide, please. So to start with, we exploit cancer killing effects of our drugs. But over time, we need to use the immunomodulatory effects of our drugs to enhance the immune system. So I would argue that steroids long-term not only are they bad for the patients and the way they feel, but it's bad for the immune system and you're better being off steroids for the long term. Next slide. And this is really what immunotherapy tries to do. It's to get your activated T cell to become angry with the tumor cell, to see that tumor cell go to it and you can see its arms coming out and it forms like a mouth in the middle, which bites into the tumor cell and causes it to burst. And so we're really understanding how to make this happen now. We're not just waving our hands saying, oh, we need a vaccine. We're talking about specifically activating T cells and allowing them to see your tumor cells. So next slide. And antibodies are allowing us to do this. And here's just a selection of the antibodies that, that exist, um, of which daratumumab and isotuximab seem to be the most active currently. Blenrep is active, but active in a different way in that it's able to both activate the immune system and deliver a toxic payload to the cancer cell. Next slide. Next slide. And then these T cell engagers. And I'm sure uh, Nina will have talked about these, but these are 
off the shelf reagents, pretty well tolerated, highly effective, even in relapsed refractory disease. And this is gonna, in a fight with, next slide, the CAR T cells. And where this plays out is difficult to know. It's difficult to know which one is going to win at this point. The only winners in this competition are going to be the patients because it's opening the door to some kind of a cure for multiple myeloma. So next slide. And so in saying that, I think cure is already a reality for many people. It's becoming more of a reality as time goes on and we introduce these immunotherapy agents into the clinic. And what's for sure is that five years from now, the treatment um, platform for myeloma is going to be very, very different from the treatment platform we're using today. So I'll finish there. Thank you all for your attention and uh, apologize again for not having uh, been able to get there to Miami and uh, to Ola, who's hosting the meeting, who I was looking forward to uh, meeting.